Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Anna and I am here with Christopher Chiano of Mechanical Systems and Analysis. He's one of our SimScale consulting partners and in this session he will be sharing with us some important tips for a better structural analysis. Now before we get started I have a few housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available later on our webinar's recording page and on our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions during this session, please type them into the question panel in GoToWebinar. And the last thing I want to do, I just want to make sure everyone out there can hear me. So can you guys raise your hand? You'll see this. Okay, good. It looks like everyone can hear me. Perfect. Okay, moving along. I'm going to kick it over to Christopher now so he can introduce himself. Okay, hello everyone. As Anna mentioned, my name is Christopher Keanu and I'm the Principal Engineer of Mechanical Systems and Analysis. Uh, I graduated from the University of Idaho with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering back in 1990. And after graduating, I went to work for Boeing's Propulsion Research Group where I did a lot of analysis on rotating and non-rotating parts of turbofan engines. And this included everything from your basic static analysis to analyzing bird amp impact on fan blades and even engine separation from the wing. Uh, after 10 years with Boeing, I moved back home to uh, Idaho and I worked for three years for a company called Multiquip Designing and Analyzing Concrete Finishing Equipment. And then for the past 13 years, I've worked in HP's LaserJet division designing scanners for the high-end MFP line of laser jet products. And that's been the full product development cycle along with a lot of simulation as well. Since 1998, I've had my own company and I focus primarily on supporting other companies with simulation expertise. And roughly in about the past five years, I've also expanded out and I've done more design work as well as helping out smaller startup companies in overall engineering expertise. Great, Christopher. Thank you for the nice introduction. And thank you again for joining us today to share your expertise in this area of structural analysis. I'm sure it's going to be a really good session. Okay. So a little bit about me. My name is Anna. I graduated with a, civil, a degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois in 2014. I have academic experience in FEA, topology optimization, and structural design. And at SimScale, I work as the community manager. So I help support our users uh, in the forum, and I deliver trainings in the areas of solid mechanics, mainly. OK, so the last thing I'd like to talk about before I hand it over to Christopher is the SimScale uh, Consulting Partners Program. So most of you are probably already familiar with the SimScale platform. It is a completely web-based engineering simulation platform. Your entire workspace is available directly in a web browser, meaning that you can run complex simulations without any additional hardware or software installations. So you, all you need is a laptop or a Chromebook um, and an internet connection, and you can be working right away. And at SimScale, we're very proud to be building a simulation platform that is community-focused and that brings the simulation tools and the users and their expertise together all in one place um, so everyone can learn from each other. And so this is kind of where the SimScale Consulting Partners program comes into play. So sometimes you have a project that requires a certain simulation expertise. Uh, maybe you don't feel comfortable tackling the project on your own and you may want some consulting on the side or an expert to help you out. And so the SimScale Consulting Partners program is just that. Our consulting partners have a wide range of simulation experience and a deep knowledge of how the SimScale platform works. And so they are here to help you be successful, basically. And so each of our consulting partners has their own page on our website. Um, we can have a look right now at Christopher's page. And so we can see here, it basically just talks a little bit about his expertise, which he, he shared with you earlier. Um, and then it talks about how you can collaborate with him. And then there's this request a quote button. And so this is basically just a contact form where you can where you can reach out to him if you want to work, work with him or um, consult with him. OK, so oops. That's, that's all I have from, from my end. So 
I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to share this screen with Christopher here so he can kick off his part of the presentation. There we go. Okay, so the agenda for today's webinar is pretty straightforward. We're going to start out with a brief introduction. We'll review some meshing and element types, and then we're going to talk about the meshing options in SimScale, and I'm going to follow that by a few examples within SimScale. After that, I'm going to briefly talk about the solver types in SimScale, talk about loads and boundary conditions, and then we'll have another live demo of how to set those up and just some areas to be careful of or to look at when you're going through the process. And then I'll finish with a few comments on the post-processing, and then we'll just wrap it up. Okay. So over the past 25 years, I've used a lot of simulation packages, including you know, Mastran, Rasna, Dyna, Ansys, SolarWorks simulation. Okay. The list goes on from there. I've been using SimScale for a little over the past year, and it's become my tool of choice. And the focus of the seminar is kind of looks back at my past years of learning with SimScale and to help others get up to speed faster. You know, so the webinar is kind of focused on those who are new to simulation or those who are coming from another tool and just want to get the verbiage right and find out where things are in the tool. So the question I ask is, when is it just a pretty picture? And I've got two results on the right of the screen that you can see. The lower one, if you can see my pointer, the lower one is a sector of a turbine disk, which I actually analyzed in about 1995. And the top one is a tractor assembly from the SimScale library. And when I've gone around and asked people which results they believe and show them these two pictures, most people jump to the tractor. You know, you can, you can see the stress results, you can see it in the entire tractor, you get that visualization, and, you know, you can even animate it, and, I mean, it looks fantastic. You know, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, turbine disk, you know, you've got some weird stress concentrations in the bottom corners. You've got some, you know, weird things going on kind of below and to the right of each hole, and then you know, back then we only had eight colors for displaying, so it looks just really coarse and rough. And, you know, the differences between these two, you know, as the analyst, you know, at the time I did it, I was sure the turbine disk was wrong as well. And I spent a lot of time having to prove to myself that that model was right, looking at all the boundary conditions, the loads, meshing. And I think with modern graphics, you tend engineers will tend to look at the pretty picture it gives and not delve so much into the results. And from what I've seen, there's been a paradigm shift more from, you know, prove to me the analysis is correct, and it's gone to prove to me it's wrong. And so we kind of want to get out of that and, you know, we want to ask, how do you know if you have good results? So to do that, the first thing you need to do is understand what causes errors. And errors can usually fall into these categories that I've got listed. You've got geometry simplification. You, know, you can either oversimplify the geometry, or in some cases, you know, too much detail in the wrong location is going to cause you problems. You've, there's, you've got the lack of understanding the math and physics behind what's going on. You know, a lack of understanding of the real loads, boundary conditions, material properties. You know, this happens a lot when you're doing analysis if you're just giving a you know, part or small portion of the assembly to analyze, and there could be alternate load paths, or you don't know the stiffness of the entire structure that's going to affect it. Yeah. You know, there's also just the lack of understanding of the simulation tool. You know, for example, if you want to do a shrink fit problem, not all tools handle it. They don't handle it the same, and so there, you need to have some understanding of your tools. And then finally, just mesh simplification, element types, mesh density, and all that can also affect your results. So out of all the sources of errors, what are we going to cover in the next you know, 45 minutes or so? So for 
Ben Lewis from Custom Machines already gave an excellent webinar on CAD geometry simplification, and that's definitely worth going and reviewing if you didn't see it. So we're not going to cover that one. You know, over on the Simsco forums, one of the power users, Joseph, he's written several articles on the fundamentals of the math and physics behind the finite element method. Those are excellent resources to review. And recently, there's also been a few more articles added specifically for SimScale that would be worth taking a look at as well. Loads and boundary conditions, that's somewhat specific to the real world, but we're going to cover a few of the uniquenesses for SimScale. And then our main focus will be looking at the meshing, the solvers, setting those up, and then post-processing. Okay, so just so when you mesh a part or assembly, you're basically taking a very complex geometry and breaking it down into easy to solve lines, surfaces, or volumes. In reviewing literature, there's over 200 different element types that are defined. You know, some of these are very common that you're probably familiar with. Others are very in industry specific. You know, that unless you're in a specific industry, aerospace, rockets, you know, you're, you're not going to see these element types. Now, the table on the right shows the most common element types that you'd run into. And you've got the 1D elements. These are represented by a, a line or curve. And typical co common types are the springs, dampers, beams, trusses. The 2D element types, these are represented by surface or plane, and they include shell elements, plane 2D elements, and you know, there's more advanced things like membrane elements, et cetera, in this category. And then we got the 3D elements, which are the volume elements, and two of the more common types are the hexahedral, or the hex element, or the, and the tetrahedral element, the tet element. And a very important thing to keep in mind here is that SimScale only supports tetrahedral elements. So, you know, this does limit some of the problems you can do to simulate a little bit, but in most cases you can work around the limitations by applying smaller element sizes at the cost of longer run times. And something like, you know, thin sheet metal parts is an example of that. It's ideally you would do it as a shell element, but without that capability you can do it as a solid TED element and still get good results out of it. Now when it comes to actually meshing the part in SimScale, SimScale provides us with four options, and that's the tetrahedral automatic mesher, tetrahedral parametric mesher, tetrahedral parametric with local refinements, and the tetrahedral parametric with layer refinements. And the last one, the layer refinements, is one that I've never actually used before, so I'm not going to talk about that one. And so we're just going to do a quick demo, kind of on the setup of the uh, top three meshing approaches. So let me get out of here. And okay, so for the meshing demo, I just want to show some basic settings for each method of creating a mesh and take a look at how the meshes compare to each other. And for the demo, I just, I've got a simple part with, it's actually two parts. Well, it's a simple assembly, I guess. And I'm going to run through just a few of the meshes that I've already created here. Okay, so the first one we're going to take a look at is, go back to our settings. This is the tetrahedral automatic setting. I mean, this is kind of the, the basic. It's a good starting point to perform an analysis because it's, it's easy. It doesn't require a lot of input. And it's good at checking. Basically, be able to let you check loads, boundary conditions, make sure your model set up correctly. Okay. So when we look at our options that we've got, we've got uh, desired mesh order. And this is first order, second order. And again, for initial setup, first order is fine. It, it's good. It runs fast. When you're actually looking at getting more detailed results, the uh, second order tend to be more accurate. And you know, my preference is I will usually switch everything to second order when I get towards final results. And then we've got this fineness option. 
which gives you everything from very coarse to very fine. And essentially what the measure is doing is looking at you know, the edge lengths or the, the overall size of the model. And then it's breaking it down into you know, these five options that you choose. And what I've done here, as you see on the screen, is the coarse option, which is yeah, a decent starting point. And then we've got the, uh, under parallel processing, we've got the number of computing cores. And the meshing algorithms in SimScale for the structural tend to not be parallelized, I believe. They're mostly serialized. What this option does is give you more memory for the solve for the uh, mesher. So in larger meshes, you want to be able to increase the memory. And you, know, you would do that to this location. Okay, so we've got the, uh, you know, this is just a coarse mesh. It was a first run mesh. Go up and click on the name of the mesh. Current changes. And it gives me the number of nodes, which essentially tells me the problem size. It's 24,000 nodes. Yeah, you, know, you judge your problems on usually degrees of freedom. So each node has three degrees of freedom. So it's about 75,000 degrees of freedom is the size of the model. And under 3D elements, we've got a little over 100,000, 110,000 elements. And give you a look at kind of what the mesh looks like inside. I'll do a quick cut down the middle. And you can see we've got a fairly uniform mesh size, you know, in areas of curvature and stuff. It does get finer as we would kind of expect it to. You know, it does have some areas where it, you know, maybe doesn't quite make as much sense where it went into a lot of detail in these areas. But, you know, overall it's quick, quick to set up, it's easy, and it gives you kind of a first good run of, of your model. So the next measure after this is the parametric measure. And let's go down here. So we've got the tetrahedral parametric measure. And this gives you a little bit more control over your mesh in that it allows you to specify your maximum edge length. And that's essentially the edge of the tetrahedral and also the minimum edge length. And this one I did, basically I picked the size here to kind of match what the coarse mesh did to see what the difference is between the two. Uh, we've got this again, the first or second order flag, and I left this first order. The NetGen 3D finest parameter. What this does is it's kind of the ratio of how quickly it will go from a fine mesh to a coarse mesh. So if this is set to coarse, yeah, I'm going to have, as I've got here, you know, when I set it to coarse, I've got my small elements here. It's going to have a very small range in which it will expand to the coarse mesh. If I set it to fine, this transition zone will be much longer and be a lot smoother. So that's kind of what this flag is setting. Uh, you know, that, that's you can just play around with that with your models. Start with course, and then you can refine it as you need to when you get better analysis. Deactivate the uh, NetGen 3D op optimization is usually left to true, and that's just, yeah. You're trying to optimize to a better element shape. So that one we really don't play with. And then the computing cores is the same as the previous. Okay, so if we look at this mesh, let's do a cutaway. Okay, so when you look at the cutaway, you can see, you know, it's definitely a coarse mesh. There's not, you know, we don't have the small mesh 
pockets as much as we had on the other mesh, the uh, fully automatic mesh. I mean, it, it still captures some of the contour better. You know, as far as like the radius areas, but it blends to the large mesh much quicker, and it's overall it'll be a smaller mesh when we take a look at it. And come back here to uh, click on the name to get the mesh properties. So the auto mesh was, I believe, around 25,000 nodes. Here we're down to 7,700 nodes. So again, it's it's smaller. The us been putting the parameters allow us to control the overall mesh size much better. And so this is just a method of giving us more control. The next one goes a step further in that it allows us to specify the global size, but it also allows us to specify local refinements. And so we'll come down here, and this is the tetrahedral with local refinement mesh. First part of this, the properties, it's the exact same as the uh, our metric mesh, we input the uh, global maximum minimum edge lengths we want into you know, our first order, you know, our finest parameter, we do all these settings. The difference here is now under we now have an option of mesh refinements and we can add a mesh refinement to, to the part. And what I've done here, this was just a really simple one. Got a rush mesh refinement, we can specify a different max, sub maximum and minimum size for the mesh refinement, and then we highlight, we can do faces, we can do edges, and we can do volumes where we can actually add that mesh refinement in. Yeah, so in here, and that's one showing up in red, but it's basically you can see by the mesh which surfaces I selected for the mesh refinement around here. So everything around this lug, I put a much smaller mesh than the rest of the model. And go back and just take a look at what that does with size. Yeah, we're back to 25,000 nodes in this model. But if this is our high stress area, we've got a much better concentration over here than the automatic mesh. So this is kind of, you know, you tend to work yourself from the automatic mesh down to this mesh to get your detailed results in most cases, because this will give you the most control of the elements where your high stresses are, and then you can thin it out, thin out the elements where you don't need them as much, give you a little bit quicker running model. Okay, so for the meshing, that's pretty much just what I want to cover. A quick overview of the three different uh, options we've got for meshing. And so at this point, you know, once we're done with the meshing, the next thing we want to do is go to the simulation designer. Across the top, and this is where we set up our simulation. And if we were to go in and just create a new simulation here, give it a name, and then when we look at solid mechanics, which we've got, and go over to, say, the simulation, we have a lot of options. And we've got, you know, static analysis, we've got the static analysis advanced, dynamic, dynamic advanced, modal analysis, frequency analysis, harmonic analysis. You know, it's, it's not just we want to do an analysis and go from there. We kind of have to choose which one of these solvers we want. And at this point, let me go back to the presentation for a minute. And okay, just finish with the live demo. Okay, so when you look at that list of solvers, we really need to know kind of what the features and restrictions of the solvers are, and know what their key capabilities are, the restrictions. And you know, from there, we can kind of understand which one is right for the problem we need to solve.
Okay, so we're in this table, we're kind of showing the two static solvers. So, so we've got the static analysis and the static analysis advanced. First thing I want to point out here is that even though the static analysis is advanced has more capability, setup-wise, it's not really any more difficult than the static analysis one. And you know the reason SimScale has got these two different solvers and it's not just one is because the underlying solver technology between the two methods differ. So the static analysis uses the Calculix solver and then the static analysis advanced uses the Codester solver. Uh, and you know, just to refresh, I mean the static analysis is basically yeah, anything that's non-moving or it's you know the loads are being applied very slowly that essentially you don't care about inertia effects of what's going on. So the static analysis, uh, you know, you want to use that one. It's got a couple advantages is that it's a very fast solver. And it's going to be much quicker. And it can also handle contact between a single rigid body. And what I mean with that is if I, for example, have a folded up sheet metal box and I want to simulate the contact at the corners, the static analysis solver, you can do that using the static analysis solver. The advanced, I would have to break that sheet metal box into multiple parts to apply that contact. So it makes it simpler for there. What we'll find when we look into setting up the solver is it tends to have more limited boundary conditions. Uh, loading tends to be more limited. And the output is basically displacement, distress, the strain is what your output is. And the solver itself is pretty much a linear solver. So the stack analysis advanced, you know, it uh, gives you more selection of boundary conditions, constraints. You can input those constraints with a value, a table. You can use a function. It also does nonlinear. So if you've got large displacements, your geometric nonlinearity. If you've got material nonlinearity, or you're hitting material yield, or you're looking at time-dependent solutions, you know, you'll want to use the advanced. As well, one of the other advantages to it is that the results, you can choose more results. So you can get out things such as the maximum, the minimum. You can get out average stresses on a surface. You can get out reaction forces. And all those are you know, great tools for debugging your model and you know, helping you get a more accurate model. As I said, the, the main disadvantage to it is you can't do contact on a single body. So the next two on the list were the dynamic analysis and dynamic analysis advanced. And such a dynamic analysis is, yeah, you now have, you're now moving. It typically tends to be more like an impact or a, a faster type problem where you have to account for the inertia effects. Uh, you know, you're loading it fast. You're playing a load really fast and taking it off to see what happens. And then we can see what happens over time a little bit better here. So again, that for a dynamic analysis, you're using the calculus solver, and you pretty much have the same reasons to use it as before. You know, it's faster. You know, it's, it's got the single body contact, and the uh, solution is basically linear, as opposed to uh, nonlinear. Uh, code ester again gives you all the same advantages as before. It also provides, you know. Damping characteristics can be assigned to materials, and I think pretty much the rest of all the, the information there is the same. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. And finally, the last three for the structural mechanics are the you know, frequency analysis, modal analysis, and harmonic analysis. And the first two, I mean, use a calculus solver, and they're, they're kind of redundant. They both calculate the eigenfrequency, the eigenmodes, and the effective mass model, which is you know, your basic frequency analysis. The modal analysis that adds a dynamic response to it, which 
basically uses a linear superposition method. The final, the harmonic analysis uses the code ester sol solver, and this one is calculating the uh, structural response to periodic load. And if you have, so if you're using this, and this is, and you'd use this if you're looking at, you know, for example, you have an engine mount, and you want to calculate its response over the uh, operating speed of the engine. Then you can use that ramping periodic load. You can get your results. You can include the damping. And that's, and that's pretty much the uh, solvers for structural analysis. My preference on the, uh, the first two, the, the static and the dynamic, is I tend to use the advanced just because that way I only have to be used to one of them. It's kind of kind of lazy. I only want to use one tool instead of two. And it pretty much does all the same things, and it's no harder to set up. So a couple notes on the boundary conditions before we get to uh, back to a little bit of the demo is you know, I kind of need to look at the different types of loadings, yeah, which is what we'll do here, and we'll kind of explain a little bit between the different contact scenarios. So one of the reasons we need to look at load boundary conditions is that they're really, that is what makes your, takes your reality into the computer simulation and makes it a, a solvable and realistic model. And if you just look at the right, you know, I've got a simply support a beam off another beam or applying a load to it. You know, I can look at just the top beam if I want and do analysis there. It's a very simplified, you make a very simplified model. And that model actually gives me fairly decent stresses. But because of the flexing of the base, they won't give me the right displacements. Whereas if I do the you know, figure three, do the analysis on the full thing, you know, it, it's going to give me better results. And that's just choosing your boundary conditions wisely will help get more accurate results. And the ones we're going to look at are kind of not unique to SimScale, but they may they set them up a little bit differently than other programs. So we're going to look at the contact options they have, you know, bonded, sliding, cyclic symmetry. We'll look at physical contacts and why that's defined a little bit differently. And then we'll cover the remote displacement and remote forces. And a, a few things to keep in mind, and we'll kind of show this in the demo, is that SimScale does not attach loads and boundary conditions to the CAD geometry, the way other simulation packages do. A lot of packages, you can go and you, you got your geometry, you pick your faces, you put your loads on it, and then you can go and mesh it later Sim scale, the meshing comes first, and then we're applying the loads and boundary conditions to that mesh. Uh, another aspect of SimScale scale to keep in mind is that for loads and boundary conditions, they don't support local coordinate systems, so everything is going to be placed in the global coordinate system. And if you want to apply the gravitational acceleration, that is under the, under the models. I highlight that just because I've searched for that several times. and. I'll show that in the demo as well. And again, the static advanced analysis type allows us to enter our loads as values tables, and we can also do formulas. Okay, so we'll go back to some scale. And let's see. Okay, so I've got my simulations that I've done. And so I'm going to take a look at just, you know, this two-part model right now. And a static analysis. So this is just the basic static analysis. And I'm just going to take a look at kind of a few unique things in the tree, and then we'll look at a static analysis advanced and kind of compare the differences between the two. So, as we choose static analysis, we 
SimScale populates the tree for us for the things we need to fill out. Uh, main differences that we see between the two solvers is when we come down to the contact area. For example, if I create a new contact constraint here, our only option is a bonded contact. That's the only option we've got. You know, we don't have the sliding, we don't have the cyclic symmetry, that's all available in the advanced. And what the bonded contact does, you know, if we look at this, essentially what we are doing is taking this surface, or this collection of surfaces here, that we can see. So that collection of surfaces in red on this part and binding them to this collection of surfaces on the other part. And so those, essentially it's kind of like a welded, you know, think of it as like the parts are now welded together. I mean, they're, they're physically bonded together. This works well for transmitting loads across the interface. If we were actually interested in what's happening at the interface, you know, the bond of contact isn't the best way to go typically. We'd have to look, want to look at other ways of would more realistically simulate how they're attached. And when we set up the model, so we basically choose a, uh, the bonded contact. Position tolerance is how close those elements or nodes are to each other to when they're actually, you know, to figure out which ones they're bonded to. And this just sets it to an automatic or you can give it a distance if you want. And then we apply the faces from one part as a master and the faces from one, the other part as a slave. Typically, the master is, you know, a coarser mesh, it's a stiffer object, it's going to be usually the, maybe the flatter object as well. Here with the shape of the, the geometry, it doesn't matter. And that's, that's the basic contact, bonded contact setup. And then we'll cover the other two when I go back and take a look at the, the advanced solver. In the basic solver, we do have a physical contact option. If we look at that. Essentially what this gives us is a frictionless physical contact. This works for basically doing like joints, bolted joints, welded joints, where you want some separation between the parts. They're not always physically contact, but they can come apart. And when I've used the physical contact, I've typically done that in the the advanced module, because we've got a few more options over there. And I will show that in a few more minutes when we get to that point. Material properties is just basically you choose your material, it's very straightforward. What I want to look at under constraints is if I go to constraints and click a new constraint, the options I have with the static solver, the basic solver, is essentially a fixed value. So to constrain this model, I can pick a face, you know, curved, whatever, and I can fix it. And that's pretty much the only option I have here. Yeah, you know, we can do it in X, Y, Z direction, which is normal. But it's, it's very limited on what our options are. You know, if I look at loads and boundary conditions, you know, if I look at the types I've got, I've got no not a load of pressure or torque. So again, we, we have a, basically a subset of what the uh, advanced solver does. So I mean, if you want to use a static solver, this is kind of some of the constraints that you need to look at as far as setting up the model. Uh, so for the setup portion, that's really about it for the static solver. I want to look at an example of the uh, It's going to be the linear, or the advanced solver here. So I've got basically the same model. I'm using the uh, 
stack analysis, advanced solver, and then we've got our nonlinear option, which is true or false down here, and it's set to false for this case. And again, if you've got large displacements, geometric displacements, nonlinear materials, or you're going to be yielding, you want to set this to true. Okay, so I've got under bonded contacts, I can come back here. And at this point now, I've got a couple options. I've got the cyclic symmetry option, and I've got a sliding contact option. The cyclic symmetry is fairly specific, and I'm going to pull up another model for that. So cyclic symmetry is basically used on, you know, where I've used it mostly has been like sectors of a disk. You know, anything that's a revolved part that you can look at, just a sector of, and the loads are uniform. And in here, basically what you define is an origin and a vector that you're rotating this part around, that it's symmetric about, and then you give it the angle of your sector, and then you come down and you basically choose your symmetry faces on each side. And again, it uses kind of the master slave notation, and really it's just, you know, one is going to be master, one's a slave, and it doesn't really matter which is which in this case. So now so that kind of gives us the bonded and cyclic symmetry options. The sliding contact option, I've got one more model to take a look at. And Okay, so the sliding contact allows two surfaces to, sl to slide onto each other. They can't penetrate each other. They can't pull apart from each other. And for example, in this model, I've added this third part down here, and I have loads going down, pulling on it. And I've made a sliding contact between this outer surface and then the inner surface over here. So those are always going to be attached, but as I pull down, it's going to be free to rotate. And this works very well for, again, transferring the load from down where I'm applying it to the areas of stress where I'm concerned at. It works well for that. As far as the actual stresses and deformation in the contact area, this does not do a good job, simply because, again, the surfaces are bonded and it essentially acts as one part. It's not bonded, but they can slide and they can slide, but they're essentially bonded on that surface. So you're not going to get true deformations or stresses around where these surfaces are. If you want to use that, you know, if, if you're interested in this area, what you're going to want to use is a physical contact. And we can go got another example just showing where that one's at. Okay, so this is the exact same model uh, that I showed you before with just the uh, sliding contact between the two. And what we've done is define the physical contact. And that is essentially, you know, any joint or any time parts are coming together or you know, where they can come together or separate, you want the physical contact in there. You know, bolted joints are very common for that. Uh, you know, Press fits will be physical contact. And with the physical contact, you get the option of whether it's going to be friction or frictionless. We give you the penalty function or the uh, Lagrange function as far as the methodology to calculate it. You know, for, this, for this example, we input the penalty coefficient, you know, you the friction coefficient. And physical contact is kind of an entity in itself, and there's a couple articles on the SimScale forum that cover this very well. 
I'm not going to cover it today just because there's a lot you know, there's a lot involved in it as far as getting the penalty coefficient correct. Uh, you want it stiff but not too stiff. And we're not going to cover that right now. But it just so that you know if you're looking at the area between two parts, where you've got that separation and you're interested in the deformations and the stresses, the physical contact is what you're going to want to see. Okay, I've got a couple questions I'm looking at. Okay, so we've got a couple questions on materials of the software. Okay, so what type of materials can be used with the software? Uh, so a quick look at the materials area. So, and so I've got a couple questions. So one is, what type of materials can be used for the software? And there's also one that, what are the creep capabilities? And so it's an, when you run the problem as a nonlinear problem, you do get the option for more material properties, and you've also got the option for creep. And, you know, so in this example, we've got you know, just steel is defined as linear elastic. And so we just need our basic properties here. But we've got a creep formulation option, which gives us Norton strain hardening, time hardening for creep. So we've got that option for creep within the material property set. And then when we choose a hyperelastic or plastic material properties, we now get a much fuller option of much fuller set of properties that we can enter. And so as far as the types of materials, you know, it's basically the isotropic, hyperelastic, linear elastic, plastic materials is what we have options for. And then creep, the creep is handled within the same material setup. Hopefully that kind of showed you where that's at and covered that information. Okay, so we will continue on. Uh, let's go back to the example that will have a remote force in there. So when you look at constraints, as you recall, in the uh, static analysis option, we basically had a fixed constraint was it. When we go to the static analysis advanced, we now have elastic support. We've got our fixed constraints. We've got remote displacement. The rotating motion is, for example, you know, spinning disk. This gives you your centrifugal loading, the RPM. And then we can also do symmetry planes here which it's not quite, it's not the same as a contact symmetry, but this is basically just, uh, you know, symmetry about a plane, I think it's, uh, yeah, so the elastic support is, SimSkill doesn't have, like, springs that we can use, springs to ground, but the elastic support essentially does provide us an option of selecting a surface or a group of surfaces and putting in a stiffness to ground. So we can kind of do that through this boundary condition. Fixed supports are pretty straightforward. The remote displacement, I'm going to cover remote load first and then we'll come back to that one. But these, I mean, you can see you get more control here than you do in the uh, static analysis option. Okay, so we're going to go to load. Okay, so I'm at the loads. Again, I've got uh, more loads here than in the uh, static analysis option, the basic option. Uh, what I have to, one I want to cover here is just the remote load. And what that gives me is if I've got this part, 
you know, I can, I can load it on this surface with a downward force, and that gives me one answer. But if I've got, for example, a bar in this hole that goes out to the side, and the force is over here, I don't want to necessarily model that bar because I really don't care about it. I just want to get that load that's off the model, off the, my main model, into the main model and back to the ground. I want to complete that load path. I can do that by adding a remote force. And with the remote force, I, if you enter your force values, you do your forces, your moments, and then you enter the force or a point where that load is applied. Typically, this comes out of the CAD system. There's not an easy way to get it into SimScale. And when you enter your values here, there's no easy way, unfortunately, to see it on the screen. So what I typically do is if I'm going to do a remote load or remote force is under the geometry primitives, I will create a point. You can, and I will create a point at that location where I want the load, and this allows me to actually just visually see where that is. It doesn't tie the two values together, but it allows me to know visually where I am actually applying that load. And then when you apply the load, uh, one of the key factors down here is the deformation behavior. You have undeformed or you've got deformable. So undeformed basically will take this load and attach it to the red surfaces. And it does it rigidly. And it adds stiffness to the model in doing so. So all the nodes on that red surface will move relative to that external force. Uh, what that does, one thing that will do when it's set to undeformable is, you know, this is a cylinder in here. The cylinder is not going to deform at all. It will stay in that shape because of the added stiffness. If I do want to see more of, you know, how this is actually going to this could deform a little bit, it's going to be a little bit softer. I can set this flag to deformable. And what that does is add the remote load to the surfaces, but it does not add the additional stiffness associated with it. Uh, basically, this would be like, if you're familiar with other systems, it would be like an RGB2 or an RGB3 element type. And the setup for the uh, let's go back to the constraints. The setup for the uh, remote displacement is pretty much identical. You can give it you know you're, you're, you're giving the properties of the point that you're choosing, so you can prescribe a displacement, you can set it to fixed, you can allow it to rotate around that point or take out the rotations, and then you enter your point detail, and again you get the deformable and non-deformable option. And even with the displacement, if this was a displacement condition about this point, these two surfaces would not deform because of the added stiffness. If I change this to deformable, it will allow them to to change relative to each other and give you a more of a realistic, potentially more of a realistic displacement on the surface. So that was going to be about it for the loads and boundary conditions we want to cover. Uh, a lot of them work similar to other programs. So there's not a whole lot of uniqueness to it, you know, than the ones that I've touched upon. Now I did mention in the uh, in the uh, earlier, and that you need to set up when you set up the uh, advanced, you have more options of outputting some results. And what we want to look at is 
Now let's just take any one of these. As we work through our tree, we get down to a simulation control. And typically our output is our displacement, our von Mises, and our, our strain. If I want more fields, I can add solution fields to it. There we go. Double click first. So I can add a new solution field to the model. And this allows me to do, for example, stresses. You know, if I'm more interested in the uh, principal stresses, I can choose these at this location and add principal stresses to the output. You know, I can also choose, okay, in this location, if we go to the strain, you've got your total nonlinear strain, you got your elastic strain. Forces is where you would pick up reaction forces. So this gives you the ability to get those results out. And as I said, you have to set these beforehand before you run the solution. And as well as that, I can also oh, sorry, I lost my place here for a second. Say that. So I can also, in the results control area, right click, and I can also add calculations based on area of volume or point of data. And what this works well is if I want to, you know, for example, take an area and Yeah, we've got, basically on this model, we've got two sides of this boss fixed. But if I just want to choose, for example, the uh, average reaction force in all directions, I can go and just pick one of these surfaces. And that will calculate the reaction forces for just that surface. So this allows us to look at in more detail, you know, individual surfaces, you know, edges. We can look at the loads being applied, the forces. We can look at, you know, again, the stress, average stresses, max stress, min stress for these areas. And again, I mean, that the whole thing here, you've got to remember is all these need to really be defined before you do your analysis. Because if you don't, you're basically just going to get the uh, displacement by Misi stress and the strain out. So I think that's kind of the highlights of what I want to cover on the, uh, the demo as far as setting up the analysis. And I'll go back to the slide set for, for just a minute. And then I've got a couple other questions that I will get back to those in you know, towards the end. If you hope you don't mind if I hold off on those. Okay, so I just want to cover up the visualizing the results. Uh, Synscale does have an online post processor. Hopefully you've all have seen that. It's, it's getting much better over time. But in the meantime, they also recommend using Paraview on your local machine. That's a free viewer. And it, wor it works very well. The online post processor is actually using a lot of the Paraview web capability. And so it's they're very similar between the two as far as what you can do. Uh, a few things to remember is, as I mentioned several times already, is the results need to be specified prior to running. You know, if you do your analysis with the default results and you go to the post processor, you're not going to find reaction forces. It's got to be set up beforehand and then you'll see them. And then the output is only in the global coordinate system, global Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, so quickly. A 
run back to uh, the model I've been playing with. We've run our analysis. We've got post-processing. And if I look at my solutions, well, let's just take look at the remote force option. Our graphic results are going to be in the solution fields. Click on that, and it will it will load the results, and it will typically load kind of default stress plot. Give it a minute to load up for a few seconds. Okay, so there's the basic stress on our model that we can see. This is showing the endoformed state. It's showing the von Mises stress. And here I can change that to got my stress components. I can do my displacement, total strange, my von Mises stress. Yeah, I can choose that in this area. What I typically like to look at is you know, undeformed versus deformed shape. So if I take my run here, this is my results. I can usually, instead of showing results on this model, I'll change it to a solid color. Let it compute for a few seconds to grab that off the server. And then I'll change its visual properties so it is transparent. So now I've got the transparent original model. And then you can go and add filters. We've got several options for filters. We can do calculations, you got contours, you can do clipping, you can look at the mesh quality. The one I'm going to add is warp by vector. That's basically a deformed plot. And change it to something we can see here, like a 20x for the scale factor. Click on OK. And you now have your deformed view and your undeformed view together in one window. And you can continue to add filters to there. If I want to add a clipping plane, I could do that. Uh, to add the legend back, to get the scale back, there's this uh, color bar toggle. Let's, uh, toggle that on, it gets your scale, which can be moved around. A uh, couple of last things on the post processor here. If I like the way this is set, if I've got a couple filters added to my part and I want to be able to come back to the state. I can click on save state and this will save the view state. And so it basically just saves all the setup that I've done here. And if I come over to my tree, I've got save states and I've got my save view state one, which I just saved. Now, if I want to recall a save state, I want to look at, so I did a comparison between first and second order course elements. And I'm going to pull up that save state and take a look at that. <coughs> now, just take it a minute to come up or a few seconds. Okay, it's almost there. 
So this one is actually loading two different models. It's loading the results from the uh, first order model and I'm loading results from the second order model and comparing them on the same screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, actually it should be showing them on the same screen. Okay, so for some reason I wasn't displaying uh, the graphics correctly. I'm going to try one more, see if we can take a look at it. Okay, so for some reason this is not getting the graphics on this. I don't know why. Uh, Any time I've had this time before, it's on the practice webinar, so I don't know if that has something to do with the webinar. But basically what I want to show you is if we look over at the tree, you know, it pulled up the results from my second order run. I was able to move it, I was able to do a display plot of it, and then I was able to add my first order results to it. And essentially to add results to it, you know, for example, if I want to add results from the frequency analysis, you just right click on the results you want to add and then add to viewer and then it'll populate it and it'll allow you to see those side by side so you can see multiple runs together and on the same scale. Uh, of course I wish that showed up, I apologize that it didn't uh, but uh, we'll just go on from there. So just kind of as a wrap up, uh, a few conclusions. You know, good looking results these days are really easy to come by with the graphics capabilities we've got. You know, the accurate results, they still require more understanding of the problem being solved and the tools being used. And, you know, th there's no way to get around that. Uh, you know, you always want to question your results. You want to be able to back them up with hand calculations where you can. You know, there's a lot of books out there, you know, Work, Stress, and Strain, I know provides a lot of scenarios that can map, you know, loading conditions that you can estimate stresses and strains, stress concentration factors, et cetera, that are good to compare to other resources out there. And then finally, you really want to do, the, you know, the convergence studies. You want to look at, you know, you start with your course mesh. You want to make sure you refine it. You look at your areas of stresses, you want to make sure you refine those areas, make sure your elements are in good shape. And hopefully with, you know, following all those little tips and stuff, you will you'll quickly get good results in some scale. Okay, great. And that's, that's it, Christopher, right? Uh, that pretty much covers it. Okay, awesome. I'm going to switch over, make myself presenter again, so we can conclude our session. Thank you again for a very nice presentation. I think these tips will, will definitely be very useful um, for those who are, who are coming to SimScale to use structural analysis. Um, so the last thing I'm going to share are the links. So these are kind of the links that were available in the presentation today. Um, these are the two projects and they're public. So if you want to go back and take a look at what Christopher talked about today and look at some of the things he set up, you can, you can certainly do that. Um, the second link is to his personal website um, for mechanical systems and analysis, 
And then this last uh, link is for the SimScale partner page, um, which I showed you a little earlier. So that's Christopher's page on our website. Okay, I think I think that's it for the day for the day then. So um, thank you again for attending this webinar. And as I said, this is being recorded, so we'll post it. Um, you'll find it on YouTube, and you'll find it on our website. And um, we hope to see you again next time. Bye bye.